Good evening and welcome to our 440 participants who've joined us so far for this afternoon or this evening's presentation and the viewers who are watching on the podcast. MHPN wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australians. Hi, I'm Catherine Boland and I'll be facilitating tonight's informative and interesting session. My experience is a clinical psychologist who works in the area of men and anger and family violence. But I'm very pleased to announce I'm, enjo I'm joined by three very uh, knowledgeable ent and entertaining uh, participants who will be who will be providing us with information tonight. First I'd like to introduce Michael Murray. Michael's a GP from Townsville. Welcome Michael. Thank you very much. Yeah. Michael, you work in rural and remote areas of Queensland. How do you find topics like we're going to discuss tonight differ for men in rural and remote communities? I think there are, uh, there are just less assets available um, in uh, rural and remote communities than there are in metropolitan areas. And also, um, it's something that I'll refer to tonight, that we are having a, um, we're going through an ice epidemic up in North Queensland at the moment, mm. and, and that confounds everything. Yeah. All right, thanks for that, Michael. And I'd also like to welcome Tony McHugh. Tony's a psychologist who's joining us from Melbourne this evening. Good to have you with us, Tony. Thank you, Catherine. Great to be here. Good evening, everyone. Tony, I understand you've just submitted your PhD focused in this area. What has led you to such, have such a strong interest in this area? Well, I can honestly say 20 years ago I had no interest in the area whatsoever. And I was in charge of a treatment program at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne, um, which at that stage dealt specifically with members of the military and uh, veteran members of that community. And the person who was running the anger management group after six months told me he couldn't do it, didn't know what he was doing, getting poor outcomes, it was upsetting him and it wasn't helpful to the client. So I had to get my skates on. I, I learned the hard way by listening to folk and that's informed my practice ever since. Interesting route to this work. Mm. All right. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Simon Santosia. Simon's a mental health social worker and counsellor who joins us from sunny Queensland. Hi, Simon. Hi, Catherine you, and everyone. You might recognise Simon's face as he recently appeared on ABC's Q&A back in February. How did you find that experience, Simon? Uh, that was one of the hardest things I had to do in front of an uh, uh, audience, a live audience of 200 people and a televised audience of about a million. So it was very, very nerve-wracking. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hopefully tonight you will uh, be well rehearsed for our webinar. Thank you. I'd just like to go through a couple of ground rules for us all to make sure we all have the opportunity to gain the most from the webinar. So we ask all participants to consider the ground rules so that we're respectful of other participants and panellists and behave as, as if this was a face-to-face -face activity. So please post your comments and questions for the panellists in the general chat box. If you need help with technical issues, post them in the technical help chat box. Just be mindful that comments posted in the chat boxes can be seen by all the participants and the panellists, so please keep your comments on topic. If you'd like to hide the chat if it becomes too distracting, you can click on the small drop down arrow at the top of the chat box. And your feedback is very important to us, so please complete the short exit survey, which will appear as a pop up when you exit the webinar. So tonight what's going to happen is each panellist is going to give us a, a specific response to the case study, explaining their approach followed by questions and answers between the panellists and between the panellists and you, the audience. There are a couple of uh, learning outcomes that we hope you will achieve by the participating in this webinar. First of all, that 
at the completion of the webinar that you'll understand the prevalence of dysfunctional anger, its consequences and strategies to help adult men overcome their dysfunctional anger, that you will have an understanding of the impact of childhood trauma, disrupted attachment and masculine socialisation on emotional regulation in adult men, and practically to explore some tips and strategies for interdisciplinary collaboration between practitioners working with adult men who seek assistance for emotional regulation. And reading through the many questions and comments we've received so far uh, from participants, I know that a lot of you are interested in hearing from our panellists about tips and strategies to engage men and uh, ways to work with men who are presenting with these challenging issues. Um, so our panellists tonight are going to centre their discussion on the case study which you've all had access to where we try to understand Trevor who's a 43 year old male who's been divorced for five years. Trevor has got two adolescent sons who he rarely sees and he's in a new relationship with Jennifer who has three young children who live with them. Trevor's childhood was difficult, living in a hostile environment with an alcoholic father who didn't give him much attention. He has difficult relationships at work and is often in arguments. Jennifer has told him to get help or she will leave. <coughs> Trevor's tried anger management programs in the past, but he's felt that they didn't help. And so we'll start with our rural GP, Dr Michael Murray. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, the initial presentation of Trevor um, often decides how one engages with Trevor initially. Uh, if one is lucky to have Trevor's partner refer him in specifically for some counselling in relation to his situation, um, one is often able to make extra time to see Trevor, so uh, possibly making a half an hour consultation rather than just a normal 15 minute consultation. But life being what it is, Often Trevor will come in with something else, he'll come in with headaches or insomnia or a knee pain or a backache and towards the end of the consultation we'll mention his um, anger uh, problems. I generally then try and sit down and, and get some rapport with, with Trevor um, and try and get him to come back and see me. So the initial, my initial aim is to A, get rapport and B, to get him to come back. You also must remember that uh, GPs are often treating the whole family and, and this makes it often very difficult to uh, provide counselling to, uh, to both partners, uh, if not impossible. And I always tend to try and avoid doing that and if, uh, if necessary I will ask one of, the, one of the partners to see one of the other doctors in the practice. One also must take into account uh, um, issues that may be coming from left field in relation to Trevor. If he's having problems at work, he may be projecting his problems onto work and he may be, um, for example, I have had a situation like Trevor's where it ended up being a work cover issue. So one needs to keep extremely careful notes um, when one's seeing patients such as uh, Trevor. As I've said, the main task should be getting rapport and ensuring that he returns Doing an adequate uh, risk assessment is important and also doing a substance um, assessment. Now most patients and particularly male patients will not give you an honest substance assessment at the first visit so I always suggest that that's revisited at the second or third visit when, when they have more confidence in you. Remembering too that there are also, there, there are sometimes medical legal issues involved after you've done your risk assessment. And then I would be using motivational therapy, trying to uh, build up uh, Trevor's self-esteem, congratulating him for coming in, uh, and often just sitting as a blank screen once one gets that initial rapport with him, because often Trevor wants to tell you everything that's in this case study so that you can understand his childhood, the considerable trauma that he's gone through leading to, to low self-esteem, just listening to him and acknowledging him and then planning the referral, understanding that he's got a high rejection sensitivity because of his childhood. 
one needs to be really careful as to whom one refers them to. Um, we're fortunate in our area in having uh, psychologists, mental health social workers, OTs, and mental health nurses, and also having ATAPs and also Headspace. And if Trevor fell into the under 25 age group, one could think of referring him to Headspace as well. Does one refer him to a male or a female? I tend to avoid Relationships Australia, even though Relationships Australia will see patients uh, on their own. Uh, because there is a high rejection rate amongst males in this uh, in North Queensland to relations with Australia, who are for right or wrong seen as being on the on the uh, on the partners on the woman's side, uh, and I certainly wouldn't be sending them as a couple to relationships with Australia. They they just aren't in that space yet. So my role would be to contain them, to provide some motivational therapy, arranging uh, the referral, um, watching particularly for transference and counter-transference issues, which are very common in this um, type of patient, addressing any comorbidities that he's got. He, he may have health issues if he's a heavy drinker, if he's been using ice, if he's been self-injecting, using dirty needles. And that's uh, often a, a good excuse to get them back. If, if one can find a physical reason to get them back, it's often um, more acceptable to patients like Trevor. Um, assessing the need for medications for any com comorbidities. Medications I would be uh, using extremely rare, rarely in a case like this unless he suffered from a, from a morbid depression or a comorbid bipolar affective disorder. Uh, and remembering that anger is not an illness with, with a pharmacological cure. Um, and then I would be looking at the wider issues involved. Um, we don't know what's happening with, uh, with, with Trevor's natural children. Are they going to be the Trevor's in, in 10 or 15 years' time? Are these kids um, belonging to his partner? Are they going to, as they grow into their teenage years, are they going to, are going to become angry against Trevor uh, and against um, um, uh, other people in general? Is, is the relationship doomed anyway? Um, and I'm always very careful not to get dragged into medicalizing a social or a, or a psychological problem. I would have concerns about the children and in a family practice that the children are presenting with things like bedwetting or, or soiling or behavioral problems at school, I'd be understanding of the situation and also understanding of the intergenerational patterns of dysfunction, which I've referred to above. And also remembering those people who are not in the room, if, if you're working in a small town, you may know his parents or his and her, and her former partners. Uh, we also have issues um, of responsibility to the wider community to be speaking up in relation to um, partner <coughs> violence, uh, and remembering the, uh, that the, one of the contributing factors to all of this are the high rates of divorce, uh, the blended families, and the absent fa fathers that we see, particularly with fly-in and fly-out um, families in, in the area in which I practice. And also remembering to keep very careful notes in case um, your, your notes will end up in the, in the family court. And lastly, I'd just like to refer to indigenous uh, patients who have a 35-fold increased incidence of uh, partner violence. Uh, so that's on top of the 25% incidence um, that, that we have in, in the Australian community in general. So Catherine, I think I've taken up uh, enough time. I'm, I'm sorry if I've gone over slightly. Um, thank that's you very much. That's all right, uh, an extremely interesting perspective, Michael. We might come back and pick your brains a little bit about some of the things uh, you're saying with engagement. I see some of our um, panel discussion is talking about motivational interviewing and how to engage the family and where your responsibilities are. So we'll come back to pick your brains. But for now, we'll uh, turn to the psychologist's perspective. And for this, uh, Tony McHugh is going to give his perspective on Trevor's situation. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, uh, Michael. Just before I move on to my slides, which you will note are very busy slides, I'm notorious for it, so apologies. I just like to echo what Michael has said about motivation and being where the client is at. Sometimes one of the most important things we can do, as Michael touched on upon it, is to listen to people. 
and often angry men and angry women for that matter um, have an expectation that they are going to be rejected. And one of the most important things we can do in treatment, and I call it treatment folks, is uh, demonstrate how to do it differently in the room and then challenge people to take it outside. This fellow clearly has a poor self-concept as Michael has touched upon and he has that classic male inability to describe feelings and his anger is <clears throat> described by somatization. You know, he, he, he could be um, the kind of fellow I think that has lots of gut aches and headaches and the like. Michael's rightly pointed out safety and separation sometimes of treatment is terribly important during risk assessments. And how do we motivate people? I'm going to get onto my slides. A really important thing for people to remember is that the single biggest predictor of a child's mental health is their parents' mental health. And that, that's a pretty big motivator. If we can get fathers and mothers to look at um, <clears throat> how their anger affects their children, it's really important. So quickly onto my slides. The first thing that I've learned over the years is to tell people that there is a path going forward. It will be safe, phased, graded and tolerable. We're not going to cast them into the void. And here, although there aren't many around, manualised treatment approaches can sometimes be very, very helpful in doing that. Persuasively emphasising the need for it to become Trevor's problem. And for Trevor to generate a, a list of beginning treatment names and what might they be? Sometimes there's things like getting people to listen to me, getting other people to change their behaviour, whether it be right or wrong, um, getting people to see common sense and the like. But Whatever the reasons, it's very important that we get Trevor to identify what causes him to be angry. When it's a problem, what factors are involved, as you can see there. First thing in session one I often do is look for low-hanging fruit. What can people actually do? And I often look for three pieces of low-hanging fruit. What can they do between that session and the next session? That they'll be able to come back and talk about as something that they have implemented with some partial or more than partial success. Identifying what is not in plan by being clear about what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. And <clears throat> developing and one useful thing in low hanging fruit world is to describe circuit breakers, techniques for allowing people to not lose it in the moment and say things that they don't actually mean and set them themselves up for behaviours they don't actually mean to carry out. <clears throat> and the final point on this slide as you can see is explaining to people that progress is not linear. It goes sideways, sometimes goes backwards, uh, whilst it will generally go in the right direction. Progress can be difficult and subject to slips. And if, if it's worth doing, people need to persevere. Next slide is about keeping Trevor in treatment, because as Michael has said already, um, there's a classic literature that says men drop out of treatment. Excuse me, just struggling with a tickle. So what we keep people in treatment by reference to is establishing credible wellness stories. But evidence-based treatment works, and um, I'd be happy to talk in a general discussion about the wealth of evidence that anger treatment works individually and in groups. Addressing unhelpful myths, there are some there. A classic that used to be talked about when I started at the REPAT 20 years ago is that clients will inevitably get worse before they get better. There is absolutely no evidence for that belief, and it's a very unhelpful one to be spreading in people. And then plausible explanatory models, and there are half a dozen or so. Find one that works for you, rehearse it, know it well, be prepared to talk about it or another, and explain it to people. We're going to be talking a little bit about learning theory, Albert Bandura tonight. Um, I certainly know that some of Simon's stuff touches on uh, what boys learn from men and what men learn from their fathers. So really important to have a model whereby you can explain explain why anger develops in the way that it does so that we can get away from the idea that humans are programmed to be demonic. And there are books with those words in them, believe it or not, and both the UN and Stephen Pinker, who is from Harvard, um, along with a very smart group of people there, they would deny that that is in actual fact the truth of the situation. Mentoring Trevor and his desire, and desire should be in inverted commas, folks, because he's got partial desire, let's face it. He's there because he doesn't want to lose his relationship, but it took him a week to actually commit to ringing someone. So desire is there and to be built upon, and then uh, causing Trevor to internalise this by illustrations. And <clears throat> this is the literature that exists on dysfunctional anger, that people who are well-liked get angry every week. That 
sometimes it's several times a week in folk who are described in very positive terms. Understanding that <clears throat> this anger can be evaluated, self-evaluated by people positively, and I'm going to say some more about that in that last dot point. Um, there's a biology around anger that um, is only really now emerging, that where people, there's a name there called Pottergill from a fantastic book in 2010, that says one of the problems with anger is that before people get angry, they evaluate it in positive terms. I'm going to show the world kind of thing. It's only afterwards that they say, that's 10 times I've made the same mistake now, and it's really costly. So um, some people refer to it consequently as a hedonic emotion. If you think of other negative emotions, anxiety and depression, we don't think of them as pleasure giving or positive value giving. But anger is really unusual in that people often see this as I'm going to show them. I call it a seductive emotion because it sells, and I know that's anthropomorphizing, making emotions into humans, but um, seductive because it seems to promise a lot and never deliver, and it delivers to people's detriment in actual fact. So continuing on with this theme of mentoring Trevor and his desire for change, inverted commas, um, it's important to get him to articulate that, um, <clears throat> that there are psychological and sociological functions of anger, his beliefs around anger, and it's treatability. We need to sell positive messages and optimistic messages, balanced messages to people that treatment actually works, and it does. And then talking in a wise and caring way with him, um, it's critical to change. Um, <clears throat> the literature on moral development is uh, decades old, um, and I, I find it very helpful to ask people what they think of their own behaviour. Is this literally what they want to be doing? Um, if they're in their wise mind able to look at it, what would they be doing that would be different? And not labelling, and Simon's going to talk about language quite a bit, which is really good, not labelling people's anger in a pejorative sense, even though it can be quite harmful at times and very harmful occasionally. <coughs> labelling and criticising is, is not effective. Teaching um, him to know his anger, it's out of control by his own description. And here, he needs to learn to regulate anger <coughs> rather than have it unregulated. And this is the, the when, the where, etc. But the crucial point here is what makes it go on? What maintains it? What are the incentives that we're not, where he's not recognising that causes it to have a life of its own? And this is about what I call pattern recognition. And it's a far less pejorative term than habits. We all have patterns as humans, helping people to identify what their patterns are and then measure them by, by the use of metrics is very important. Motivating him again, cost-benefit analysis, it seems so easy. It's such a fundamental tool that got picked up by motivational interviewing years ago. Yeah, is he winning or is he losing? And if people are honest and committed, they can only help but understand in the long run that they lose out by being angry. And <clears throat> there are several books around that talk to this. Some of them are quite old. Tavris's book on, on anger, the misunderstood emotion, just laid out 30 years ago. And it's true that people actually die earlier from anger. They get cardiovascular disease. The, the Americans and the Japanese have shown this for probably 50 years in a really robust literature. People even get um, tumours and cancers in greater proportion when they're chronically angry. And of course, they have dreadful relationships, not only at domestically, but at work, as we can see with this fellow. And here's a really important concept um, that I've talked with lots of people about, that anger is one over happiness. It's the inverse of happiness. And we're not talking about schadenfreude, getting one's kicks from seeing people being miserable. I mean true happiness. Angry people are angry and miserable is my um, common finding. Um, getting towards the end, actively treating uh, Trevor's anger, and there are methods, absolutely evidence-based methods, and we can talk about them later in the cognitive domain, the affective domain, physiologically and behaviourally. And there are some really important key concepts, and I will refer you all to a book by a fellow called Daniel Kahneman, again from Harvard. Um, great teachers, just a dreadful way of getting there, you have to pay a fortune, not in favour, I'll keep going. Um, slowness. If you ask angry people, they will say that they are going at a thousand miles an hour. They cannot think straight. They make mistakes. You know, they drive off the road. 
they break things at work and at home when they don't mean to. And there's a really robust literature that basically shows that people become cognitively diminished in their anger. So this is about skill development, skill change, and <coughs> this shows all the preceding steps that Michael's outlined have occurred around risk, etc. And I'll talk to this later if I need to. There are four domains we talk about in clin psych often, the cognitive, the affective domain, the physical domain, and the behavioral domain. And I tend to try to choose one technique from each domain. Self-instruction training, happy to talk about that later. It's a no-brainer, it works. Teaching people to tolerate and not act upon their um, affect, uh, because men um, are comparatively not as good as women at describing emotions. Sleep, let's face it, if people have got chronic sleep, the literature is really clear. You can knock off one standard deviation of intelligence. So if in the Mensa club, you move out of it. If you've got good average intelligence, you become average. If you've got average intelligence, you become less than averagely intelligent. And the final thing is exposure. Exposing people gradually to the things that they fear, um, the things that uh, they are avoiding so that they can effectively uh, move on these things in treatment. So uh, that's my lot apart from some references. There they are, enjoy them. And I'll now hand over to uh, Simon. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. That was uh, wonderful. I think a lot of people would like to hear a little bit more about self. Thanks, Tony. That was uh, wonderful. I think a lot of people would like to hear a little bit more about self-instruction training. But we will move to Simon uh, to give <coughs> his perspective on the case study. Thank you. I've always um, said and argued that working with men cannot be separated from the wider political, social, gendered debates there is in our social work profession, but also in society about men and masculinity. And you just have to see the whole DV debate and the focus on domestic violence and how it's impacting guys in the, in the community. So from that framework, uh, fr from that perspective, we need to hold a multiple frameworks to be able to, to guide our practice and our interventions with, with Trevor. The first one I tend to use, and I use all these frameworks, they're all interconnected, is, is feminist understanding around risk and safety for women and children. So Trevor is not coming into our room in isolation. He's impacting as soon as he leaves our room into his family. So as we can see from the case study, his stepchildren are in fear, his partner is walking on eggshells, he's disengaged from his teenage children who we know from the literature, adolescent males really need that positive relationship with their dad. So there's lots of people at, at risk there. And using those feminist principles, we know the best way to protect women and children from harm is to engage men quickly, engage them effectively in ways they will engage and stay engaged in, in the treatment process. And we can use that by using a strength-based non-deficit male engagement approach. And I'll be talking about that in, in a minute in more detail. Once we've engaged him, once he feels comfortable, safe, once we've initiated his drive strength for change, so change happens from the inside out, then we can use our deeper understanding of masculine psychology, attachment, trauma, neuroscience, and, and evidence-based interventions a lot of what Tony was saying to create that that um, motivation from change and create real change from the inside out. So I just want to spend a bit of time on, on helping people understand what the masculine engagement approach is. And to do that, we need to know what doesn't work. In all the research on engaging men, men report disengaging from services if they feel they, they are being judged patronised, blamed or shamed for their behaviour. Quite frankly, being the expert or, or um, telling the man what he needs or shaming or blaming him in any way, he'll just cut off and he'll disengage. And the strength-based view of men reconceptualises our understanding. It came from the, um, the Howard government's funding of the Men and Family Relationship Program in 1998. And we've had 15 years of evaluation and research. Unfortunately, the program is no longer. But out of that came a whole lot of research on what 
effectively works when engaging blokes. The non-strength based engagement approach covers um, a friendly male style, so meeting the bloke where he's at and taking him on a journey. Being solution focused and solution orientated, using practical strategies and interventions that, that speak to him and the use of appropriate language. And it's the use of appropriate language that I, I want to talk a bit about because that first telephone call we have with Trevor is a sales call. And this is why I say we, we need to take our therapist hat off and put a sales hat on. Why should he come to see us? What do we have that he needs or wants? A lot of people blame men for not engaging and I argue it's it's our approach that needs to change. So that tele first telephone call, we need to connect with him. How you going, mate? What's happening? You sound like you're in a, you know, you've got a lot of stuff going on for you. So simple language, avoid jargon. Use positive, non-judgmental, action-orientated language. And it's got to be about what's happening to him. What's his situation? What's happening to him right now? Stay away from the feeling words because blokes will always do something. And you'll find, uh, and as you can see what Trevor does, is you say, well, mate, when you get angry, what do you do? And he'll tell you what he, what he does. And then you go, well, is that working for you, mate? Well, it sounds like you're sitting on a lot of stuff. Why don't you come in and have a chat? Metaphors are really good for opening the lines of communication. I often use a metaphor the relationships are like cars. We, if we don't get them serviced, they break down. And a lot of us folks ignore the warning signs. And like an oil light in a car, if we ignore it, it breaks down. So coming into to someone like me, I don't call it counselling. I call it having a chat. Coming in and having a chat is just like getting your car serviced. Language that, that's available to them that they can relate to. Once they come in, and I built that rapport and I built that connection and I talked to them about what's happening using strength-based language and metaphor. I very much talk about how as men were socialised. And I, I can either use the diagram that you see in your slide or I'll do it on the whiteboard. And I'll brainstorm the messages he got as, as a, to be a man. What are, what are the messages he got to be a man growing up? A lot of guys get messages from their parents, from from the media that we have to be tough and strong, in control, be a provider, feelings that are a sign of weakness, show no emotion. But there's another side of, of being a man that's equally as masculine, that we can be not bound by gender roles, caring and sharing, empathetic, able to show and express feelings. A lot of men, if they experience shame by father, um, and especially shame by father or shame in the schoolyard can develop what I call survival skills. So they will start to disconnect from their internal experience to keep themselves safe. So they will ask an 18 year old bloke what he feels and he'll say, I don't know. And he honestly doesn't know. He's, he's developed that strategy to keep himself safe. So men will start to externalize their pain rather than, than have that insight. Once we, we broaden the conversation out and really talk about their, um, their, their socialization as men, where they got their messages from, how they were fathered, uh, what were the messages they got about fathering from their father, then we can start to really bring in the neuroscience and help them understand how our brain gets shaped, how how often the emotional part of our brain, and if you look at Trevor's case, he's hypervigilant to rejection, he's hypervigilant to, um, to any hint of, of being disempowered because that was the experience he had as a child. So he's hyperreactive and then he sets about stories of hostile intent. Once he understands his brain function and his reactivity, then we can start to really work with him on those practical strategies to help him self-regulate. Awareness is the key to change and once he becomes aware of what's happening inside his brain, similar like a mechanic becoming aware of a car and teaching someone how to drop their own oil, we can then work with him in helping him regulate his emotions, developing the, the signs of dysregulation 
and practical strategies to regulate himself. A lot of the interventions that, that Tony was talking about we can use that also very much link the guys into pro-social men's groups. Um, and here in South East Queensland, we have men's wellbeing that run eight-week facilitated men's groups and which take the bloke through fathering, through relationships and really help them with pro-social support. And in this way, we've engaged him. We've engaged him in practical strategy. We've helped him to create change from the inside out and therefore we've protected the women and children in his life from harm. Thanks. That's, that's me. Excellent. Thanks, Simon. So interesting and so relevant. I really like your practical tips for engaging men from a feminist perspective and then talking to them in a way that is non-shaming. And so many of our panel, panel um, in the panel discussion have been uh, wanting to hear a bit more about that. There are a few questions I'd like to throw to the panelists that have, that have come up from uh, some of the discussions and some of the questions. And I'll throw this open. I, I noticed, Tony, you said a little earlier that obviously um, there are many other people. The ripple effect of Trevor's anger goes wider than just him. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you might bring up the conversation about anger as a parenting, um, ha having an impact on parenting. How do you keep Trevor engaged and bring up tricky issues like that? Anyone in the panel can help, help out answer this. Well, I'll have first, Fab, as uh, you invited me to. Mm. <clears throat> um, this case material says that Trevor doesn't talk to his uh, boys from his previous marriage and his current boys are quite frightened of him. Um, as a parent, um, and it's not hard to imagine if you're not a parent, um, you don't stop caring about your children till the day you die. And even though we can be estranged from parents and parents from us, um, it's a really important motivational lever. People care enormously about their children. Mm. I think if you ask people you know, in a forced choice kind of way, what would be the most important thing? It would be their kids. Yeah. And I, I think that this is a highly motivating uh, piece of information. I don't assume that any client wants to be the way they are, whether it be for, and we've got three fundamental negative emotions. They talk about the big three. There is anxiety, depression and anger. We wouldn't think that people with anxiety disorders or depressive disorders would want to be that way. Why should we think that about disorders of anger? We can call them plural because there are more than one types of um, type of uh, angry presentation. So, Kids are a fundamentally important um, leader. And then asking um, Trevor, you know, what is it that he wants to be? What, what does he, how does he want to parent? What is in his best imagining, notwithstanding everything that Simon has said, and it's absolutely correct. We're often talking about a poverty of thought here. And it can be a psychological mechanism for keeping things at bay. But I also think sometimes it's just that people have not had the models and the opportunities and they don't know how to express themselves. So getting him to articulate a vision, and I'm not talking so many, you know mission statements here, you know, I'm talking about a vision, a wise vision of how he would like to be, where he is now, and thinking a bit like an accountant. I don't know if anyone else does this, but I've been doing this for years. I've got a one, two, and a five year plan. What do you want to look like in a year? What do you want to look like in two years? What do you want to look like in five years? Before I can even get halfway through this phraseology, they say, why would I want to be coming and seeing you in two years' time? Right? So really getting people to conceptualise the future and working backwards in the steps that enable them to get there. And the first step is to control your emotions, basically, for the betterment of you and the people you care about. I thought I'd take a minute. I've taken more than a minute. Over to others. If, if I can just jump in, um, Tony. There's, in, in the strength-based approach, there's, there's also very much what's used is, is a child-focused approach, so bringing the children in the room. And one of the, the questions I generally ask in, in the first session is, how did you want to father? When you said, how were you fathered? That's number one. How were you fathered? And we explore how he was fathered. And how did you set out to be a dad? When you first held that little baby in your arms, how did you first set out to be a dad? Then the next question is, how are you actually fathering? And that's often that, 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 that aha moment where they realise that their fathering 
how they were fathered. And that creates the drive strength to change. It's a very powerful moment um, when, when it happens. A another technique that I do is, is get guys to, to visualise what would it be like to be fathered by them. So I get them in the, in, to, to imagine what it's like for their children to have them as a father. And that also initiates that aha moment. Mm. Fantastic. Thanks, Simon. Yes. Um, can I, may I just add something? Absolutely, Michael. Oh, yes. Um, I've done a fair bit of work with Headspace, and, and particularly with, with young, uh, angry men. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the tricks that I find that's quite useful with angry men is to just get a whiteboard and do a genogram. And, and just, again, and just referring back to what Simon said and, and what Tony said, you get the genogram up and you say, well, you know, just tell me a little bit about this guy, about this father, this grandfather, this, this stepfather, your half-brother, and, and just try and get them to ventilate um, how they see other men and how they see other men's reactions and the influences that their fathers and stepfathers had on them. And then, as Simon and Tony said, then introducing how do you think this is going to have an effect on your relationship down the track and children down the track or children that you already have. So I'm a, I'm a great believer in the genogram. If you put the genogram up, you, you see lights coming on in, in, um, in, in the patient's head. Yeah. Yep, really good point. Green totally. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering um, also uh, for the panel, a, a few people have been kind of asking about things not to do. So what would be some examples? I know Simon you were mentioning not shaming, not patronising, but are there specific phrases that you would or things or behaviours you would definitely avoid with a, a person like Trevor? Um, I would I would not use language that that would shame him at at all. Um, like, uh, what are you doing? Don't you know you you need to take ownership or responsibility? Any language that that quite often um, in my field, a lot of people can be quite overzealous in in trying to protect harm for women and children, and in their overzealous aim, aim often forget that. A person like Trevor is coming in quite disempowered. That there's a whole series of him um, being done to as a child. Uh, there's quite a lot of trauma in there. So it's important to, I guess, engage and not use language that he perceives as blaming him for his actions. Although he is responsible for his behaviour, as we can see in my diagram, that a lot of men are, are very vulnerable to shame, blame and criticism. And a lot of guys do drop out of therapy or counselling when they feel that they are being blamed rather than the counsellor walking with them on a, on a journey. And it's, it's really, I guess, something to keep in the back of your mind is what I'm suggesting. Is he interpreting that as shaming or blame? Because he won't tell you. So it's really important to check out with him his meaning interpretation of any interventions that we use. If, if, I, if I could add to that? Yes, please. Uh, it, it endorse all of that entirely. There's a really important stat that would be very important for people to take away. That all of the big washing machine meta-analyses um, across the world have been done on anger. The modal number of sessions, that is the most common number of sessions, that men show up for, because it's typically men, is eight. Right? I'm deliberately going slowly here. It's eight. When, by estimation, 25 is probably the minimum. Right? So Simon's point is incredibly important. This is what Deffenbarker, Jerry Deffenbarker says, and he's one of the leading theorists or practitioners. He says, just get people to keep coming back. Mm -hmm. right? It's incredibly important. Michael talked about their expectation that they are going to be rejected. Because let's face it, if people are angry and hostile enough for long enough, people reject them. And a, a, 
a kind of Kevin Rudd question to you folks. Who do they end up associating with when they're really angry and they're getting rejected by people? You got it, angry people, right? Whether it be down the local footy club, down the local bar, at the gym, where, at work, wherever, they're associating with angry people and they're getting really bad advice from them. So what we need to do is simply to keep them coming back 20 times, 25 times. Now, the question was, how can we alienate them? Um, the first thing is to give them imperatives. Thou shalt, right? Because they've got imperatives in their mind all the time. They're telling everyone else what they should be doing. They certainly don't want to hear it from us, so do not tell them what to do, right? It's about listening, folks. It's about being there. Silences is another one. Silences can mean anything. They can mean I completely agree with you. I completely disagree with you. And what's more, I'm judging you right now. Um, so do not be silent. Do not be worn down by these folk who want our help, right? They will try to bamboozle us and beat us down at times, all right? Um, collusion, I should have said it first up. None of us are colluding, of course. I'm just patronizing you. you we do not collude with people, okay? Unacceptable behavior is unacceptable behavior. If it gets to a point, it's reportable behavior. Uh, let's be really clear about kids being at psychological harm, right? Risk thereof. And the last one, and I don't mean to open up a Pandora's box here, but I challenge you all in saying this to look at the, the literature. 2002, it's listed in my references as a paper by a guy called Brad Bushman. He says the worst thing we can get people to do when they're angry is to vent. And catharsis is in the title, when we all know it's a term that's been around for a very, 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 very long time. And even the author of it actually changed his view on it towards the end of his career. The worst thing we can get people to do is go to the gym when they're angry or go to the gym before they're going to a situation where they're going to be angry. Do not get people to engage in catharsis. It's disastrous. That's what the literature says. It's not what I'm saying. So don't do those things and uh, it'll be easier. <coughs> the other thing that I, I, I do feel quite strongly about, and I, I just want to remind you all about it, that our, our substances, um, you know, alcohol and other illicit substances. Um, some, some studies show that 35% of all patients sitting in your average normal suburban general practice have had an illicit substance in the previous seven days. That's 35% of people sitting with you as you go in for your checkup. So, uh, and also if you notice a change in a pattern in, in somebody in a family of getting suddenly ang angry and displaying anger at work or at home, always think of ice. Um, it, it really is out there. It's becoming a huge problem in rural Australia. I, I'm sure it's the same in metropolitan areas, but uh, alcohol, um, as well as the number one, it is the number one problematic substance as well. So just bear that in mind. And I also take the points of everybody else about just providing a safe environment for the for the patient so that they they have somebody who can actually listen to them. And often just listening, the patient will come up with the answer themselves. Yeah. So and it would be nice to have 28 sessions. I can tell you, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be lovely. <laughs> there, there are no such systems, Michael. <laughs> and those that are, exist are under attack, as we know. All right. Uh, can, I, can I ask the panel just to, uh, if, if anyone's got any comments, uh, had a lot of feedback and uh, questions about some of the specific cultural issues that may be relevant for Trevor um, or clients like Trevor from particular cultural backgrounds and including, of course, Indigenous um, men. Any comments about how treatment might be particularly um, focused on individuals from different cultural backgrounds? I, I can... Individuals from different cultural backgrounds. I, I can speak to the, um, I guess, working with Indigenous men. I worked for two years at, at Cowan, our Aboriginal health um, service here on the Gold Coast under the ATAPS program one day a week. And with them, it's, it's again meeting men 
where men are at and changing the language. So rather than counselling, it's yarning, having a yarn. And I talk about the different types of yarning. There's a there's a type of yarning where it's just how you how you're going, is everything okay? But there's the deeper yarning. So that's the yarning they do with each other. But coming in and and talking to someone like me, like a therapist, is having that deeper yarning about stuff that's bubbling away underneath, stuff that, that is really causing difficulty with you. Of course, any work with Indigenous people really needs to, to go through the elders, go through the, the people, through the community, especially as a non-Indigenous person. You need to be sanctioned by the community. You need the okay by the elders. And once they trust you, then the other people will come in and and will be able to to trust you. Much of the interventions are the same. They're just really um, tailored to the individual person, uh, their level of, of I guess um, of cognitivity, where, where they are and their education levels, and just where they're at in the state of mind at that particular time. Um, I'd like to offer a couple of other perspectives. I endorse everything Simon said. Um, what is culture is a really interesting question. So let me talk about a couple of cultures that we may not think of instantly. I've done a lot of work, obviously so, with uh, military culture and veteran culture. They are a distinct cultural group, folks. Let's be really clear. There is as distinct as indigenous culture. Right. Let's talk about other cultures from a working class culture. Now, if anyone knows Melbourne, I'm a boy from the northern suburbs. You can take the boy out of the suburbs, but you can't take the suburbs out of the boy. And there is working class culture. There's absolutely no question. The local footy club, the local cricket club. And this goes to the point, Simon's point about language all of the time. Be respectful, yet challenging of people's language. Uh, let's talk about some of the terms. You know? Idiot. Nobba. Um, if anyone doesn't know, uh, canine quadruped dog means something different in working class culture. Okay, so let me morph into criminogenic culture for a minute. And I think we've got some people who work in prisons just looking idly at the chat. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a culture that you learn in places where you are incarcerated and it is passed on. But something that's not often thought about is that you've committed a crime, and let's say it's a violent physical crime the odds are enormous that you've had that same crime committed to you. Huh? And we talk about victims of crime as having PTSD, but often the perpetrators have PTSD from their own experiences as well. So this gives us a really great angle to work with that culture that says, you know, you've been traumatised, mate. You know, did you know that? You know, do you dream about things? Do you think about things you don't want to think about? And then think about unhelpful things that you'll do when your time's up, etc., etc. But culture, you know, Culture is a really broad term. We need to think sophisticatedly and we're drawn to obvious cultural groups because of the deprivations they've suffered and the injustices and all those sorts of things. But culture is, you know, culture by culture. There are many different cultures. We've got to get in the heads of the culture, so to speak. Yeah. And should I just add um, to that, Tony, that mass maleness, is a culture. When I do my talks around this, I ask all the men that if when you were six or seven years old and you fell down on that playground and you um, hurt your knee and started crying, what happened to you? And every single bloke will say, I got called names. Hmm. And as soon as a child hears a male child hurts himself, he will hear, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. And already that starts that internalization, that that my emotions, which are an innate part of me, men feel, men feel pain, we grieve. But socially, we're told that our emotions are not okay. And then we start to put, push them down, as, and that's part of our cultural norm. Then we get into a relationship, and our partner says, but what are you feeling? You're not talking to me. And the very thing we've been taught to do as men, to keep ourselves safe, now goes against us in a relationship which can cause a lot of problems in a lot of relationships. So that's why the, when working with men, we really need to understand the wider 
socio-cultural conditioning and tailor our approach accordingly. Thanks, Simon. So interesting. I guess one of the other things that some of the panellists would like to know about is obviously as clinicians we're walking the fine line between engaging with, with Trevor, keeping him coming back and uh, engaging with these techniques but also we have a responsibility to the other people. How do you manage those responsibilities? For example, when do you make a notification to the Child Protection Services or when might you get Trevor's partner in? And how might you collaborate with other professionals on those issues? May I speak to that? Um, yes. Um, yeah. Look at. I think certainly in Queensland, we we have we. It is mandatory that we report um, child abuse or any suspicion of child abuse. So um, you know, this is a fairly new topic at at most GP meetings. Um, I think discussing it with a with a senior colleague, if you're unsure, I mean, if it's an open and shut case, it's pretty easy. But if you're unsure, discussing it with a senior senior colleague or discussing it with your insurance organisation is certainly a way to go. And um, you know, you know, I think if if there is a suspicion of risk nowadays, we're we're in an extremely risk averse culture. So unless you're at, you know, unless you're absolutely sure that something's going to happen. Um, you're, you're often better off discussing it with colleagues, just sitting back, because often um, a lot of mayhem can be caused by um, unskilled people um, making um, decisions um, about risk. Uh, so I would always be discussing it with other colleagues, with senior colleagues, with other disciplines, uh, and then I'd have no problems in making a notification if I felt there was a risk. That's just the way I approach it. Um, if I could offer a, a couple of contributions, um, and you've just touched on something incredibly important, Michael, and it was daft of me to not mention it in my slides. But if someone is coming to you, and often it's not clear in session one or two, but if they're coming to you and it becomes pretty quickly apparent that they've got an irritability problem, so to speak, um, then we're obliged to give them the appropriate warning there and then. And it might be in session one, right? but it might be session two or session three. If you do this, Squire, you say these things to me, I am obliged to do this. Right? Now, we can't have that as a means of shutting people down for all the reasons we've talked about tonight. So the sensitive sensitivity with which you say that <coughs> it's really important. But if you think about the consequences of not saying it, they're worse than the difficulty of saying it. Because suddenly we're potentially playing snap with people when we haven't informed them of what it is that we're meant to be doing. You know? And Michael's right, the, the bar is set pretty low in Victoria. The legislation was changed last year. It's every adult in Victoria, when they believe that a child is at risk, it's every adult, it's not every practitioner. It's every adult has an obligation to report, right? And you can be charged for not reporting. So I think to set up the expectation right from the start that we're being frank, but in you know, an incredibly sensitive way, we're not there to finger wag and bring out the shoulds and the musts and the imperatives. There was also the question of when do we involve partners, if we do involve them. It's preferable that we do, quite clearly. But I, I reckon there are two ground rules. It's when the fellow can commit to behaving in the way that we've been modelling and talking about and coaching and teasing along. And secondly, as a consequence, when it's safe. We have to be really clear that we don't bring partners in and cross that boundary unless safety is assured because we can't have people declaring things in front of other people in either direction um, with, with unintended consequences. So, you know, um, be safe, report, but let people know that um, there are certain things, as, as we do, it's, it's in our ethical guidelines for psychology, you cannot not say these things. Yep. <clears throat> I, I absolutely agree with both Tony and, and Michael. Here on the Gold Coast, we're very lucky to have a whole lot of uh, networks that, um, that, that get together and do risk assessment. And I get a lot of my referrals from from our child safety or, or doc in that that environment. Um, 
and and the assessing of words when I open the um, the slides with the feminist approach is always understanding that they're vulnerable people in men's lives, and our first priority is, is to hold the, the men account for his actions, but in a way that he can can do it from the inside out. And and the first thing is to engage him, as I said, and then start to really men. The thing with men is once you build that rapport, once you build that connection with them, they, you can really challenge them. You can say, mate, with all due respect, that's crap. And you can really hold them to account. I really value phone calls from the partners. I, I actually do get a lot of phone calls and they say, hey, I just want you to hear the other side. Um, and if it's safe, and only if it's safe, and I always pose the question to the female partner, I, I say, if he were to say something, if you were to say something in the session that he wouldn't like, would you have any fear of repercussions afterwards? And if there's any hesitation, then according to the literature um, and just common good sense, couple therapy is contraindicated. You, you just wouldn't go there because you're placing her, her at risk. But ultimately, if you work systemically, and if you're dealing with two people with disorganised attachment or attachment conflict, using a, a, an emotionally focused approach, you see a lot of them, the, the attachment um, trauma is reacting off each other and helping the, the couples understand that and understand the dynamics of what's happening in their relationship can really be helpful. But safety, safety is, is the first priority. Thanks, Simon. Very um, relevant and interesting. I, I feel like we could talk and talk and talk. There's so many complex issues here, and so much interesting discussion happening on the pa on the panel board as well. But I guess we've come to the time of the uh, webinar now, where I'm going to ask each of you to just give a little bit of a reflection about some of the take home messages or the key things in working with men with dysfunctional anger, like Trevor, and with particular reference perhaps to how we can collaborate professionally. We'll start with you, Michael. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, I think um, I've, I've certainly learned a lot just from, um, just from listening to, uh, to Tony and to Simon uh, this evening. Um, I think uh, we should all remember that, uh, that men uh, need to be listened to. Um, they shouldn't be spoken at or hectored or lectured. Um, they do respect boundaries when the boundaries are mm -hmm. are, are given appropriately and and clearly. Um, they need to be understood, particularly their their childhood experiences, because many men repeat the mistakes that their fathers made, and their children repeat repeat the mistakes that they make. Uh, and I often find that. Putting it in the intergenerational uh, perspective, as I mentioned with the genogram, is, is often a useful way of, of, of managing it without shaming or without blaming or without, uh, without uh, using any of those pejorative um, terms or attitudes towards, uh, towards patients. So listening, engaging, uh, not being afraid to get them back again for a further session. Um, and being open and honest with men. Thanks, Great. Catherine. Great. Thanks, Michael. And over to you, Tony. Can you give us your, your summary reflections? Uh, building on everything that's been said tonight, I would simply offer these few thoughts. Teams are best. There's nothing worse, folks. And let's face it, um, there are some very limited systems we work under, both in the private and the public sector. Limits abound. There's only so much we can do, and there's nothing worse to complete the thought of sitting with someone who's really angry in your room, session one of ten, for example, thinking, by golly, this is an interesting referral. I didn't anticipate this. So if we're really client-centered, we've got to think about um, how we share this client with other people. And uh, our overworked GPs are an incredibly important source of ongoing support for people, but controversial thought because in the treatment program I was involved in there were lots of, lots, and I do say lots, really skilled psychiatrists 
who understood that the treatment for trauma is psychological, not, not medical. And again, under Medicare, they are not limited in the number of sessions. They can have 52 sessions a year and more before they even get questioned. To find some really thoughtful people, we're not asking them to do psychotherapy necessarily. We're asking them to do basic psychiatric management and keeping, helping to keep people safe. So having a team around us is really, really important. And remember, champion team will always beat a team of champions. So if we're a team in name only, pretty pointless, um, to get on well with our fellow practitioners and talk to them um, and to be a great team around someone is better than having a collection of individuals. So they'd be my thoughts. Know our limits, know when to get assistance outside, when to refer on to, and, and know our limits really clearly around what we're obliged to, to report. It's really important. Excellent. Thank, thanks for that insight, Tony. Over to you, Simon. I once presented a paper at a national men's conference titled um, Creating a Secure Base Using uh, Using Trauma Attachment Neuroscience with Strength-Based Interventions with Men. Basically what I've argued here, what we're doing is creating a secure base. A lot of men like Trevor didn't have a secure base. They've and, and from the attachment literature, there's a, there's a disorganized or a, a severe form of, of, of anxious attachment and which, which causes a lot of this reactivity. Change won't happen unless he feels safe. Men won't share unless they feel safe. A lot of people say, oh, men don't talk about feelings or men don't talk. They do if they feel safe. I've facilitated men's groups where guys can go to incredible depth but there has to be safety. And unfortunately, a lot of the approaches are not safe. For instance, if a guy who can't see his kids because he's just separated, and why do men work? Why do we go out for, to work? Because we've been socialized to show our love for our kids. So when separation, divorce happens, the very thing we, we, we have gone to work for is no longer there, and that's our family. So guys will drop into grief but won't be able to identify the grief, so they will present to services angry. They'll talk about their partners, in ex-partners, in a very angry way. If people hear that, often they go, you need to do an anger management course. We can't help. What they actually need is someone to sit with them and help them process their deep sense of grief, their deep sense of loss, and use a lot of the strategies we've talked about. It's about humanising men. It's about seeing them more than just their behaviour, that they're people too. And the, the political environment we're in at the moment, my accountant said, I feel ashamed for being a man because every time I read the newspaper, it's about men are violent. And it seems the, the only issue we have is, is our anger or violence. But there's a hell of a lot of stuff underneath bubbling away that's driving that. So I would say the first response is, is treat the person, not the behaviour. Connect with the person, and then together you can walk on a journey to help treat the behaviour. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. That was a, a wonderful insight and uh, summarised thoughtfully, I think, the perspective uh, many contemporary men feel. I, uh, in summary, I, I think that we've covered such a broad spectrum of topics and I think the common themes that you've all touched on are the real need for non-judgmental listening and engagement with men like Trevor, keeping them coming back and engaging with them sensitively in a very particular way. I, I also think that there's so much information that we didn't have a chance to get into detail about the sort of empirical uh, uh, literature that's available to all of us and to inspire positivity in clients like Trevor, that there are very good treatments, that there are very mm. efficacious treatments yeah. and that they work. And it's, the onus is on us to become aware of those and I think excellent resources from you in particular, Tony, um, that we'll be tap well, I'll certainly be tapping into and some of the resources on your list. I think that it's a wonderful reminder for us all to Remember, we have very good evidence-based treatments in this area, provided we can keep these men engaged. Of course, we didn't get a lot of time to talk about 
how to treat comorbidly aged. Of course, we didn't get a lot of time to talk about how to treat comorbidity with substance abuse and alcohol abuse, but touched on the issues of child protection and involving family members and the effect of family violence on others. I think that probably what this leads me to think in some of the discussion is that if, if you uh, participants are wanting to set up your own special interest or network in this group, then you should join one or perhaps join an existing one that touches on this issue because there is a wealth of information as you can see from our webinar tonight and a wealth of expertise and experience. This also brings me to uh, encourage you to uh, help us by filling out the exit survey which will pop up on your screen at the end of tonight and also extend an invitation to you to join future MHPN webinars and you can keep an eye out for notifications. The next uh, webinar will be in November, which is titled Working Together to Manage Methamphetamine Use, and that's on the 25th of November. So before I close, I would like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who've lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. I would like, on behalf of everyone, to thank our excellent panellists this evening. It's been enjoyable, entertaining, and incredibly informative. And thank you, of course, for all the um, panel discussions, which we look forward to looking at in detail. That's been inspired and informative.